The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, and welcome to another episode of The Engine Room. I'm Andrew Rocks, and today I'm going to speak to someone special. Oh, uh, stop it. <laughs> Self-proclaimed special, actually. No, I made that up. <laughs> um, I'm speaking today with uh, the founder and CEO of Pivot Wealth, Ben Nash. Good morning, Ben. How are you? Good to be here, mate. Good to be on this side of the microphone. For once, that's right. And, and um, uh, it's also great to be interviewing someone who's a fellow passionate ensemble person and a fellow director of ensemble. So um, um, without any further ado, we'll, we'll get into it. And, and given that this is a very rare opportunity for you to be on the other side of the thing, you better behave yourself in this podcast. Mate, I'm just, I'm just sitting here just waiting patiently for my question, so bring it on. <laughs> well, what I'm dying to, to hear about is is uh, the Pivot Wealth journey, but, but more importantly, just a bit about yourself as far as, you know, how you've got to where you are with Pivot Wealth, um, your journey, you know, some of the trials, tribulations, and then, you know, a bit of a vision of where you're looking to take it. But, uh, yeah, what's the Ben Nash story? Well, uh, yeah, good to be here. I, I suppose when I started in advice, I uh, it actually took me a bit to get into it. I didn't go straight from school into uni. I went out, started working, making money, and it was only a few years later that I randomly got given a book about finance that sparked an interest in investing. And then I sort of went down the, the rabbit hole from there, went to uni, studied finance, um, fell into a job in uh, a pretty big, well-known uh, financial advice business that will not be named. And uh, it was a great place to learn, really solid shop from a technical strategic perspective. Um, and then I was there for a couple of years, started getting a bit of an itch, um, but too scared to take a leap. Thankfully, they uh, did our jobs for us and made most of the advice team redundant. Uh, from there, left and went to a small business. I'd never really thought about working in a small company before because I was sort of, and naively I know now, but pulled into that allure of, you know, the big businesses and the mahogany desks and all of that sort of stuff. But I, I when I was looking for jobs, I got approached by this mortgage broker that was running a, a mortgage broking and and he had a lawyer that was working as well. They were helping people and wanted someone to come in and build the financial advice arm of the business. Sounded really interesting and exciting. Was way out of my uh, depth, but, uh, you know, can talk or at least could talk enough. So I taught myself in, into that job and yeah, it was really sort of interesting to to learn and try and figure out a whole bunch of stuff because in the previous company that I've worked in, everything was spoon fed. We were told how to do everything. You basically just followed the bouncing ball. Whereas in this role, it was very much figure it out, figure out what's going to work, and then do that, and, and then learn. What year will be talking, Ben? So I started in this small company in oh, it would have been about 2012, 2013. Yeah, and that was actually the time that uh, that Ensemble kicked off as well, like around that time. And I, I knew a couple of the other co-founders, uh, Clay, Adrian, Ray J. There were a bunch of other people around at that point in time. We were all sort of 
trying to figure out advice. That was sort of how Ensemble uh, kicked off and learning these things, how, you know, FOFA was all, you know, the the front front and centre for people. It was at, 212 at, uh, as well. That point yep. in time, yeah. So trying to figure out, you know, fee for service advice and charging for SOAs and building a charging model that we had no idea what to do there. So, um yeah, I worked in that business and I was I was looking to become a partner in, in that company. We had those discussions for about 12 months and it, it we got right down to the finish line and then it became clear that there was a bit of a values mismatch around the, the you know, how we wanted to serve clients and what we thought was going to be best for them. So I made the call that to leave and then I didn't really want to go and work for anyone else and I'd sort of, again, naively sort of thought I, I knew a couple of things. So I decided to start my own company and then um yeah P- pivot wealth sort of kicked off from there so just a couple of things you you randomly found a finance uh, book that started this whole journey mm. and was that the catalyst for you to become a prolific author in the financial services space <laughs> well as someone that that failed english at high school i i didn't think that writing a book was going to be on the cards let alone a couple of books so uh, yeah, it wasn't really what I had in mind at that point in time, but I did, I, I got a lot of teachers in my family and I was always drawn to the educational aspect of advice and, you know, trying to create those light bulb moments with clients. That was something that gave me a real kick. And I think all advisors do that. You know, that's a big part of our job is educating people on the strategies and the things and how to make decisions and how do we equip people to do the best things for them. So that was always something that um, I got interested in. And then when I started my business, I, again, naively thought I knew, you know, enough about advice and actually running an advice model. What I didn't know about was how to get clients in and, you know, content marketing and that whole world was something that I had no exposure to, but r- recognized that there was an opportunity there. And yeah, and that's where the content piece just sort of started and it's, and it's built and evolved from there. And look, it's it's a it's a very big part of, of pivot. And we'll, we'll get into that as as the podcast goes on. But it's interesting you mentioned about um, a lot of teachers in your family because there's the whole concept of nature and nurture. And when I hear about your backstory there, where the first organisation um, was was a large corporate that you thought you wanted, but possibly um, wasn't appropriate, and, and and potentially also questioned some of your values at the time. You didn't realise you were formulating, and it wasn't until after your second incarnation that you went, no, I want to do it this way and you probably harked back to that that mm. nurture of of those teachers sort of giving you well if you educate people and you enlighten people and you give them that light bulb then that's a good thing that's a positive evolution and also it's probably something you could create a living out of yeah absolutely and I, and I think that for it doesn't really matter like i work with a lot of younger people now and that's always been a focus for me at pivot also in the previous business it was a lot of younger people as well business before that was a lot of older people but i don't think it doesn't matter where people are on their journey typically when they start working with an advisor there's still so much stuff to learn and then the world of money and markets and strategies and tax rules they're changing all the time so there's always something else to educate our our clients on and ultimately i think i think historically advice was probably a little bit more we're telling you what to do. But for me, I think that the best advice is we're helping you make the best decisions. And I think it's a significant difference between those two things. But I think that the latter really does lead to better outcomes for individuals and ultimately people sort of building their money muscle. And, and you know, it's not just catching the fish. You are teaching people how to fish. That makes them better clients and it means that we can actually add more value over time as well. They probably make better referrers as well if they're understanding what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. So um, the pivot then started what year? 2015. So in 2015, you're out there um, and you – tell me about your first client. Where did they come from? Because you just admitted that you had very little knowledge of content marketing, which for people listening who follow you, staggering, but um, – um, you know, seven years ago, you were, you were, you were blind leading the blind. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, well, I think that the first client that I got, I actually got from LinkedIn. And I, when I started my business, I put a website up, I put a few different content pieces on there. And then I just started um, connecting with people on LinkedIn, probably spamming a few people and, and trying to promote the 
the resources that we had, the guides and downloads. And uh, I remember I had this one guy worked in tech sales and he, yeah, he replied to me quickly, he said that he wanted to come in. I was like, oh, you sure? Okay, great. Uh, come in. And then- we Are you sure it's not the classic sales line? <laughs> that was in my head. I don't know if I verbalized that one, but- uh, Came in, had a chat, talked about what we did. I, you know, shakily put across my uh, my little brochure that I had that I just probably just tightened up the the um, the packages on, you know, fifteen minutes before, and uh, yeah, became a client, and then it sort of built from there. But I think when I started the business, it was just me. Uh, so, and I think that that's the beauty of of financial planning businesses. And granted, it is harder, you know, more costs, establishment costs, and those sorts of things these days. But it really. There's not a lot of costs in an advice business. So you and if you if you're charging a few thousand bucks, which is what I was charging at the time, it's like you didn't really need a, a lot of clients. So it wasn't like there was a ton of pressure there. Um, and yeah, and we basically just just sort of built from there. The early stages, it, it was just myself for the first twelve months in the business. Uh, then I brought my now wife into the business. We worked together for the next two and a half years, just the two of us. After that. And I think the first three years in the business, I was bringing on about 20 new clients each year. So it wasn't anything earth shattering. I was doing, you know, a couple hundred grand in revenue or something. And it was just like sort of slowly ticking up. When my wife and I got engaged and were planning to get married, we we were also planning to start a family and realized that something needed to change because at this point we're now sort of three and a half years into the business those 20 clients a year a bunch of them had stayed on the book so we had you know that there was a base of of ongoing clients there we were, the number of new clients was also increasing from the work that you know the the foundations that we build and just continuing to sort of follow the bouncing ball we'll probably talk a little bit more about that um and we were busy i was busy i was working pretty long hours for just for clients and then trying to actually run a business around that as well. So we realized we needed to grow the team and bring on extra support. Plus my wife was doing everything else that I wasn't doing. So I'm thinking like, we're going to, she's going to have a baby. Um, something's probably got to give here. So uh, that was when we started growing the team and, and sort of build on it from there. And was that the, was that before or after the establishment of the growth of the beard that you're synonymous with? Well, I had a beard from day one. That was, I, I had a beard actually in the first company that I worked in, you weren't allowed to have a beard at all. That was that was just the, the rule. Uh, and then when I left and went and worked at the smaller company, I had a really short, really manicured, well, was it wasn't really manicured. It was just a really short beard. Then when I started my own business, I, I graduated to my self-employed beard and uh, yeah, then there was the COVID beard phase, but that's probably a memory I'd rather forget. So, Kieran, the sound guy, if we can just make sure that uh, attached to this podcast is the evolution <laughs> of, of the beard. But um, I suppose just, you know, ch- changing changing gears a bit there. You know, at this stage, you, you know, I now know that you're a father of a couple of beautiful young children. So mm-hmm. clearly building your engine room has worked. So mm-hmm. maybe get a bit, give me a bit of a feel for what where the, the, the current state of, of your your business pivot is um, are two two aspects because one of the unusual or in fact impressive parts is the engine room that you have to bring clients into your organisation mm. that is, that is particular and, and quite quite voluminous. That I'd like you to talk about and then once they're in, just the org structure and how you get people to do things and what motivates them. So maybe if you want to start with what you've done to bring people in. Yes. Um, and uh, congratulate your wife for putting up with you. <laughs> well, she deserves a lot of congratulations, that's for sure. But uh, look, I think w- one thing that is a little bit different with how we do things at Pivot is that we separate out our sales function and our advice function um, pretty distinctly. So, so separate people even? Separate people. Oh. So I think that advisors need to be able to sell. I, I think everybody needs to be able to sell. They need to be able to sell ideas. They need to be able to get their point across. They need to sell people to, you know, particularly with clients, getting them to do the things that they want to need to do to get the outcomes that they want. But one of the things that I realized in growing a team is that it's actually quite a different skill set from for what you want from an advisor and what you want from a salesperson. And for for an advisor, at least at Pivot Wealth, we need someone that 
likes people sure but like someone that's into the detail around technical strategies and supporting clients you know nailing their file notes and making sure their soas are rock solid and all of those sorts of things that's not necessarily in fact it's not actually the same as someone that thrives on you know building relationships and selling people just talking to people all day every day we actually for an advisor we're looking for someone that's probably a little bit more detailed orientated maybe even a little bit more introverted that is going to nail all of that detail so that the clients can rest easy knowing that we're all over that stuff behind the scenes whereas for a salesperson we want someone that can talk your ear off and just loves being in conversations but we don't really want or need someone that needs to be super detail orientated in fact you probably don't even want someone that's super detail orientated because when people are buying they're buying you know at an emotional level at a bigger picture level rather than an ultra detailed level at least in my experience so one of the questions i'm going to ask when we get into the people section and just make sure i do remember this is that um you're talking about distinctly different sort of hemispheres of the brain left brain versus right brain and mm. and what i'd be really curious to to, to learn um in due course is is do you do you recruit for specifically for that? And if you do, do you use any tools? Yeah, so like at the moment, we're recruiting for a salesperson and an advice person, um, two, two separate people. So we use, we use a few different ways that we assess people, but one of the big, big ones that we use is the Wealth Dynamics Profiling by Roger Hamilton. Uh, basically, for anyone that's not familiar with that, it just has that there are four different energies. There's people energy, uh, detail energy, creative energy, and timing energy. So for a salesperson, we're looking for someone that's more on the people side, uh, For a, but they don't necessarily need any of the detail energy, maybe a little bit, but probably not. Uh, whereas for an advisor, we want them that's he heavy on the detail side. Ideally, a bit of the people stuff as well, but really the detail needs to be there. So we look at that as a big part. And we know like that like for me personally i don't have any people energy you know, if you look at my profile but well, that, that's going to be shocking for our listener to i know be really yeah. honest and <laughs> i did know that that was going to be a point because um i do know you as a very specific detailed um individual who um has managed to teach yourself how to do the people side would that be totally. fair to say yeah and i can do it and i have done it for years for for 10 years i did all day every day and still do for a lot of days i'm talking to people all day but if i'm just uh meeting after meeting with people all day at the end of the day i feel drained if i spend a whole day working on a spreadsheet or a project or a process i feel pumped and i want to work all night so that's what we want and it's like our we've got two business coaches and we'll probably talk about this in a bit more detail but both of those coaches they've got tons of the people energy and they've got very little of the detail energy but both of them if you if they and they have helped us with stuff in the past where it's like if we're working on a process and they need they know that something needs to be done they can detail up a storm to get it done and i think that's the thing with all a grade players that for us when we hire an advisor it's not like they're not going to be out of their element talking to people of course they're not like a sales manager wouldn't be out of their element knocking out a process if that's what needs to be done but we want someone where it's largely in their flow so that they're not pushing shit uphill all day, every day, um, and then feeling frazzled at the end of every day. So let's throw caution to the wind. Um, who are the coaches that you use? Uh, we use uh, Abundance Global, David Dugan. So we've been awesome. work, working with him for six or seven years, and Michael Back is our other coach. Um, again, to, uh, we're actually back his first client after he started his business and uh, have been with him all the way through. So. That's a human to human business. Human, human to human. Yep. Yeah. Uh, both legends in in their in their spaces, um, and yeah, they now I think like with any good coaching, it's the same with our advisors that they a big part of the value that they bring is that they understand us and our business to a level that when something comes up, a challenge or an opportunity, that they know how we will respond because there's there's no one right thing to do like for our clients when something when a COVID market meltdown happens there's no one right way to invest off the back of that but there is one right way for our clients and that's what they sort of guide us to do so um given that you've just articulated that you believe is and you operate a big difference between the sales and relationship then into the execution if i could maybe just kick to the execution for a bit that's is a gentleman called tim in your organization 
heads up that. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, and and what, what, does that, what does that look like? So how many people are in that team? I just want to get a feel for sort of the engine room that services your inbound clients. Yeah, so basically how the business is structured is that we work under a pod system for our advice team. So we've got a senior advisor, an associate advisor, and a para planner. Our para planners are run offshore through our offshore team through VA Platinum. Then we have alongside that, we have the sales manager um, and we've got a couple of sales managers in the team. We And then we have a couple of implementation um, managers as well. So once the advice is done, fulfilling, doing the applications, doing That's the life right. insurance, et cetera. Yeah. And with, uh, with the addition of the sales manager, which would be a more unusual structure um, for a lot of our listeners, what does that do as far as volume? So with that pod, what, what kind of volume of, of, of clients or opportunities will be running through that on a weekly or monthly basis? Well, my a target for advisors is that each advisor in the business can manage a million dollars of revenue. So all of our clients work with us on a 12 month fixed term contract. So basically we bundle up the initial planning work and the ongoing service over each 12 month period. And the clients pay one fixed dollar base fee to, for us to support them with that. Yep. So yeah, so the aim is- And does that, does that, sorry, does that roll on based on the anniversary when they've come on or do you have like a- those are fixed July. term with an end date. So every yep. every agreement needs to be renegotiated and a new agreement made um, for them to continue getting served by and paying us. So it's not ongoing. What if one Which coincidentally fulfills almost every obligation required anyway. Well, it means no fee disclosure statements are not required because they're essentially getting their annual statement each year yep. when they do that. There's a no um, legislated opt-in, although practically we obviously want to opt people in so that they keep paying us. <laughs> no opt-in, no million year. dollars, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so that was part of our thinking in doing it, but also that we, you know, we pride ourselves on transparency as a business. We charge premium fees to to our clients. Our average fee is $13,000 a year. So it's not a small number. We also charge 100% of our clients through their bank accounts, either personally or through, you know, through entities if they're, um, uh, you know, if they've got entities, but they're aware that they're charging us a fee. So we, yeah, we, uh, I suppose we, there's no, we didn't feel like that it wasn't already clear. And so therefore it's not like a difficult conversation with someone getting them to re-opt into our, to our ongoing services essentially. Plus also, you know, if you do the one or two years with a, with someone and, and potentially they don't require as much um, service going forward, well, then you can sleep very soundly in that you've you've clearly priced and articulated the work for when you did it. That's you right. Have, you haven't subsidised today for for this this thing that might may or happen in the future, yes. which means that you, when it comes to rewarding your own team with their, you know, short-term incentives or even ESOP, which we'll talk about later on, mm. that you've properly priced. Is that is that correct? That's right, yeah. And that was something that a mentor taught me. In fact, one of your uh, roundup, uh, your new podcast stream coming out with uh, the one and only Mr. Dean Holmes that taught us that, you know, when you have a client and they walk away and you just think, fuck, like that, I didn't charge them enough and now I've done all of that work and you know, they've walked away and it's it's impossible to escape that because naturally some clients will take out more of your time and resources as a business than other ones do. And occasionally you still have that element of frustration, but I do know hand on heart that our pricing is is appropriate for what we're charging people such that if someone walks away at the end of their contract, I don't feel like that we're, we're behind. So if your average fee is $13,000 and you want that million dollars and that, that means that each one of those pods is going to be sort of circa looking after 100 and something clients each, right? That That's correct? 75. 75. There you go. That's my maths. That's uh, it's, uh, 75. There you go. Um, and the the new business, so maybe we, 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 we have a look at the, the new business because, um, you know, the, the Ben Nash and Pivot Wealth that, that a lot of our listeners will see is the front. Yes. Okay. Um, I'd love to maybe hear about how you do that, maybe give us an idea of your, your money education partners, explain what you th- how you thought about that, um, who they are, what that works, and then um, just an insight into uh, something you built called a smart money um, accelerator. Sure. So about 25% of our new clients come from client referrals. The other 75% come from our content marketing essentially, or largely, largely, there's probably maybe 5% that come from our partners. So other mortgage brokers or accountants that refer into us, but largely, yeah, it would be 70, 
70% uh, or so coming from content marketing. That's through the main channel, social media, uh, specifically TikTok, a large number of, of clients coming through there. Um, Instagram increasingly as well. I've got a podcast, uh, a book or two books that I've, I've written. Prolific author. Uh, yeah, well, that's a couple. Um but yeah, a, a little bit from from there, and then just our email database and and marketing out to to that database as well. So those um, those sources, we, and we tend to sort of dial them up and dial them down based on the campaigns that we run throughout the year. But they they result in new inbound inquiries. So one hundred percent of our new business comes from inbound inquiries. And then when people make inquiries, that's when the sales manager's jobs are to um, convert them into doing our, you know, we do a 15 minute phone call, then we do a 45 minute meeting, then we pitch our services and get the clients to sign on on the 12 month agreement. And then at that point, they get handed over to the advisor to deliver or the advisor and that advice pod to deliver the work. I might just unpack that if you don't mind, because yep. um, yet again, departure from the normal one. So I'm, a, I'm an inbound inquiry. I've, I've, I've had two or three touch points and something has resonated with me and I've, I've emailed you or made a call to your office, the sales manager, the team lead, they then give that person a call or, or a Zoom or a Teams, whatever it is, and you run through, is it like a, is it, is it a fact find light or, or what's what's the, the thing that you do to, to get them into a position where they want to then commit for 12 months and then go down and, and execute? Yeah, so there's a 15 minute uh, phone call and then a 45 minute meeting. The purpose of the 15 minute phone call is to make sure that we can help them and that they can afford to pay us. That's it. Simple as that. We're not, you know, sort of beating around the bush. And we're very, very clear with our new, in, uh, the, the inquiries about um, how that all works, essentially. So when someone submits an inquiry, we basically just send them an email and say, this is what we do. Here are our services. We're super transparent with our pricing. We say we do two things. One is our personalized financial advice services. The pricing of that starts at $700 a month. The other is our smart money accelerator, which is our group coaching general advice and, and education solution that starts at $300 a month. If you want to talk about the first one, book in a call here, then they book in a call, then we um, educate them with some content, but basically have that call with the sales manager. They're just saying, what is it that you're looking for help with? And then what do you, give us a snapshot of your numbers so that we get enough of a sense to know that it's worth taking the next step for both them and for us. Then we chart, we do a 45 minute meeting. We charge $195 for that. We donate that money to charity. Um, that's through our charity partnership with B1G1. So basically we are essentially donating our time for that meeting. We wanna make sure that the potential clients are serious. So we take the $195, we donate that money to charity. It makes them feel good. And it, uh, that's really helped with oh, that. It's really conversion. clever. I, I, um, your website sort of also gives us a, a real snapshot of what you can buy with what's donated and, and yeah, it makes totally. it real life. It's yeah, good. and we've had we've made millions of impacts through our partnership with B1G1, who's an amazing company that helps with, with business giving. But for us, no one's making money doing $200 meetings. So I don't care about $200, but I do care that they stump up $200 so the that psychology. they start. Because if they're not going to pay $200, <laughs> they are never going to pay $13,000. So um, that was the sort of thinking around that. And then with the 45-minute session, it's really just help, again, making sure that we can deliver on what we want and then help helping them understand how we will help them so that if they do make a decision to jump in and sign on for that 12-month period, they know exactly what to expect, that those expectations are realistic, that we can deliver to the expectations, and they're basically setting up the advice process for success because – with the amount of new business work that we do and the amount of clients that we're working with, we want everyone to follow the same process. We we know that everyone's a snowflake and you know there, there needs to be the occasional departure from that or the intricacy in how we tackle certain aspects of their financial planning or their financial situation. But largely I want everyone to follow the same process because that's the only way that we can drive the engine room of the team, that we can manage them, um, manage the task management, how do we know how an advisor is performing, how an associate is performing, how a power planner is performing, how the implementation manager is performing? So we make sure that they're cool with that because some people that, well, yeah, some some people aren't and that's okay. The, the, you know, we know we can't be all things to all people. We're confident in what we do deliver and, you know, th it is what it is. Spoken like someone who's uh, a very detailed, focused manager. The, <laughs> what I'd really like to know is, um, so uh, 
the handover. So the handover from the cool relationship focused person who's really bonded with this person, they've then sold them this great opportunity. And then at some stage, they're handing them to the detail focused person. So how do you craft that so that it's a, a seamless handover and almost seen as a win for the client? Yeah, well, we do. I, I've put together a, a video that explains how we work together as a team and what people's different roles are. Because as you sort of touched on, and as anyone that's sort of come across Pivot will know that I do most, like 90% of the content is me. So I'm sort of like the face of the business, but I actually don't take on clients. So um, we put together some content because I keep getting that question. It's like, oh, can I do the call with you? Can I do the meeting with you? Can you be my advisor? I'm like- well, Very reminiscent of Paul Clitheroe back with IPAC. I, I, IPAC back in the day where every retiree thought they were seeing the guy from the Channel 9 money show, <laughs> but you can't clone yourself. No, that's right. But we explain to them how they are getting this. And I'd say to every single, like any ongoing client of the business, they can talk to me whenever they want at any point in time. So if someone wants to have a meeting with me, they absolutely can. There's a few of them that take it up, not a lot, but that's because the team are amazing at what they do. That's why they They're doing are, their job. That's why they are the team. Yeah. yeah so we know that the sales managers do the front end, they shepherd them through, then they introduce them to the advisor there. And when I say that we hire people and maybe they're a little bit introverted, all of our advisors are great people, people, and they start strong in those relationships and they know that in that intro call that they want to pick up on the great work that the sales managers have done to bring them into the tent, you know, set the expectation, set the agenda, pump them up on the opportunity. I had um, had Ryan King on the podcast and I love the way that he puts this, that he said that he's a hype man for for his clients. He's their, he's their hype man. Um, and that's what I've told all of our advisors are the same. And it's like the, the sales managers start that, the advisors carry it through and then the team execute on that as well. And I think, um, you know, when it's, yeah, we're, obviously we've been considered with the words that we put in the structure of how we do that, but ultimately it is a win for the client. So we just make sure that it's clear to them. So they're not just trying to figure out why it's, uh, why it's structured in that way. And, uh, you are self-licensed, um, and you've just, just explained how, you know, you're conflict free and whatnot, but but ultimately, you would. Did I say conflict free? Is that a restricted term? I don't think I said that. I, I probably you didn't a say that. Or, <laughs> huh? I can tell you don't have an advisor anymore, Roxy. I, I, I did. I did. I did accidentally say <laughs> ICAC instead of IPAC about five minutes ago. Hey, C, <laughs> cac, cac. <laughs> so, um, but is there any? So the way in which you ultimately invest your clients' money is: Do you have any? Do you have any sort of like? platforms or providers that that you work with best from an operational perspective we use uh we for superannuation we do a lot of work with art so sun super and we've been working with them for a number of years because we're heavily index fund you know, passive index fund in, investing i would say that over 80 percent, probably over 90 percent of our clients money is invested into passive index funds mm -hmm. so art is a solution um Bit for people that want ethical portfolios, and that's something that our clients are interested in and that we're seeing a bit more of, then we tend to do that on platform. That tends to be Net Wealth or Hub 24. Um, for personal investments, we do, again, similar with the platforms or sometimes um, brokerages directly. Self Wealth is, is one of the platforms that we've used there for direct ETF investments and uh, a ton of stuff with Gen Life with their investment bonds for a lot of our clients because we're working with higher income earners that, um, yeah, we, we're loving those structures and, and it adds a lot of depth to the strategy that we can do with clients as well. So, um, yeah, they tend to get a bit of love. And, and what about what about the sort of the technological tethers that hold this together? What's your tech stack? Because um, ranging from, you know, the, the social media all the way through to the delivery. Well, we're, it's distinctly different in the or distinctly separate, separated in terms of the marketing and sales side and then the advice delivery side. So on the advice delivery side, we use X-Plan. We use it extensively. We, um, the processes and tasks and the reporting that sits around that. Uh, we put a lot of time and a lot of So, so that's the, you've mapped out the threads per se, is that what you've done? All of the threads are there, but beyond that, we've we've got some of the tasks 
throughout the advice process we know are more important than others. So we have defined those as bent, what we call benchmark tasks within the advice process. And then basically every team member has different sets of benchmark tasks and we we track and manage their completion of those tasks to the timelines that we've collectively set together as a team. And that's an important way that we measure the performance of the team. It also ties into our incentive plan. It ties into the ESOP plan. And it gives, for me, as a um, as a leader or as a manager, probably as a manager more than a leader, it allows me to manage but be a data-driven manager um, instead of having to have any people energy, I suppose. <laughs> Well, I think instead of actually just making reactionary uh, sort of uh, em emotional decisions. Well, having... we know that the data is there. And we also know that with like the pod structure, that that's something that I wanted to set up so that everyone's working in their genius zone, so that no one is doing work below their pay grade, but so that everybody has a clear progression plan to develop their skills and then to learn more and add more value for the for themselves, their career, the clients, and the business moving forward. And do you do you call it a progression plan with them, or what's what's sort of everyone's got a, a progression plan, and yep. that's again that's something that we uh, we so we do a six monthly progression planning session individually. We do six weekly one on ones to the progression plan. Um, but yeah, we want everybody to be on a be clear on where they're headed in the next six months to the next two years and for that to be aligned with the business's goals and their personal goals, where they want to take their income, where they want to take their work, where they want to take their day-to-day. -day. And we, one of the beautiful things of a, of a growing business is that there's always opportunities for people to progress their roles in slightly non-linear parts. And I'm all about that because if people are interested in different things, then great, let's, let's get them involved in those things. So yeah, I feel like I sort of covered a bit of ground there, but essentially gives me a lot of confidence in the, how the work is going, but with, with me taking a macro view. On the marketing side, we're, just to uh, close out on that question that we do, we, we're using the marketing channels directly, but essentially we use monday.com gotcha. for all of our sales tracking and reporting. And for me, that's super powerful, their data visualization, helpful, really easy, like relatively easy to set up used to use some pretty complicated spreadsheets, but this is much simpler. Um, well, you told me to that when you, a super complicated spreadsheet gives you energy and brings you. But, I love uh, it. But well, ma maybe Mondays yeah. uh, will also give you energy by Absolutely. Uh, doing that. Now, before we move on to sort of the team uh, or how you're running your people, I just wanted to ask a question. So you've got a you've got sort of an incubation. Uh, you've built an incubation for future clients around that, that smart money accelerator and whatnot. Um, and lots of other people potentially have thought about it or have done it. What's the matriculation from someone who's engaged into that um, moving into your full service? Yeah, so the Smart Money Accelerator is, like you say, it's like an incubator solution that what we realise we, we're generating all of these potential clients, these leads or these prospects, and we know that at the at our average price point of $13,000 a year that there's a, there's a pretty significant contingent for you know, law of large numbers, that there's a lot of people that aren't quite ready for our full financial advice service. So we wanted to do something to keep them in the tent. Absolutely. To make some money and to also help them get to that point faster. So we developed this um, smart money accelerator service where we can do that. So basically, essentially help them save more money, invest more money, but importantly, keeping them in the, in the tent with regular touch points and interactions with the business so that they can step up when um, you know when when it is appropriate for them to do so we only launched that in March so I, I um, launched it to coincide with the launch of my book when that came out what's the book called Ben replace your salary by investing subtle not not subtle plug get around <laughs> it on uh, all good booksellers of, of choice. Uh, but yeah, we're, I, I wanted to put it out so that it lined up essentially with that because I figured that's going to get out to people as well and probably cast the net even wider that again, I know that there's a lot of things that people can do. And previously we've been letting those people just figure it out and broadly stay in touch with us, but we wanted to make something sort of a bit more formalized. So it's still pretty early days, but we have had a, a number of clients already that have joined and then graduated through because they get a sense of what we're about. They see that it's not scary. They see what the opportunity is. And I've also been thinking that people, sometimes for people that are actually 
at the start ideal clients for the $13,000 thing that maybe they don't want to commit that much money because they don't know. And it's all well and good to have a great sales meeting and have a lovely brochure and have some nice TikToks from someone. But it's another thing to pony up that level of commitment. So committing at 300 bucks a month and then going, oh, yeah, actually, no, this sounds pretty good. Yeah, it lines up with what I'm thinking. Oh, let's do the dance. Then uh, that seems to be happening. So I'm pretty excited about that. And I also think that like for a lot of advisors, really that we need to get better at that as the as the cost of advice increases around Australia and around the world that people are priced out and we need to be doing something for those people because they still need oh. help with their money. And tech is filling the gap, but advisors need to be doing that as well. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there for advisors. It needs to be a hybrid approach, a- absolutely. And, and um, you're right, not everyone um, trusts you day one and, and that's a function of their nature and nurture or it could even mm. be a function of, of their experience uh, in the past. But um, uh, with your, the name of your book and having read um, a large sway of your book, um, the name Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cool Dad was obviously uh, trademarked <laughs> yeah. and taken. Is that correct? <laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the naming is not my strong suit. I had to get Clayton to, to put the name on my first book. So at least this one I did come up with on my own. But oh, Fantastic. Uh, pretty practical. Like, you know, it does what it says on the tin, I suppose. So we've spoken a fair bit about um, where you've come from and, and the machine that you've built and how it yeah, and we probably enlightened some people, uh, enlightened um, the fact that that this that the marketing doesn't come naturally to you, but you have a data-driven analytical approach to it mm. with a real ethical and transparency bent, which comes through in spades. But my question to you is about your team, okay? So you've got a headcount of just under 20 people. Mm-hmm. You know, why do people join you? Why do they stay and why would they grow? Yeah, it's, a, it's uh, good questions. Look, I, I think that... We know who we are. We're not trying to be all things to all people. And we know that there's amazing. So who are you? We're Pivot Wealth. Um, (laughs) But look, I I think that to to answer a different question, if you were to say like, what are your points of difference? That the points of difference for Pivot Wealth as a business is that we're very results driven. And I know that that's a really dumb thing. Well, it sort of sounds a little bit dumb to say as an advisor, but I think historically that we're advisors are probably a little bit guilty. And I know that I've been there getting excited about delivering financial plans. But ultimately, like the people only want the financial plan as a stepping stone to get more money in their bank account, to have a better retirement, all of those sorts of things. So I think the more we can do about actually delivering those outcomes for clients. um, And can I call you out on that? Because literally the first or second page on your website, Mm -hmm. it it pops up saying that um, that Pivot Wealth uh, delivered 72,000 $71,203. $71,203 Dollars, $71, worth of savings or, or worth of benefits to mm. your clients. Now, that's a lot bigger than 13. How, how do you get to that? And potentially there are other advisors out there this is happening to, but just don't have the self-awareness. Yeah, totally. Well, I, I think that as, as the business grew and the team grew that I – as and I'm sure that there's be a lot of founders out there that could identify with this that when you're building everything yourself that it's often really easy for you to explain everything because you understand all of the stuff that sort of sits behind the scenes whereas when you start bringing new people into the team that haven't been as intimately involved in every single aspect of your advice process and business and your clients and they don't understand all of that stuff that you need to give them things that they can hang their hat on or at least that was what I felt so um We've spent a lot of time quantifying the results and the outcomes that people get from the work that we do. For us, there's there's three different ways that we measure that. And this is not unique to us in in any way. It's just we've spent some time sort of thinking about it and pulling the data out that as advisors that we deliver what we we call um, the the advice upside, which is a $71,203 number that you saw on our website. What how we measure that is we look at the trajectory that our clients are on when they come to us. So if they keep doing exactly what they're doing and they walk through our door, what, what does their financial position look like in 12 months' time, five years' time, 20 it's years' time? classic Polaroid. Yeah, of this and then yep. we compare it to after they go through the financial planning process, they decide to do things a little bit differently. They make some investments, they pay down some debt, they crank up some contributions or whatever, uh, and then they end up on a different trajectory. We measure the difference between those two, and that's where that number comes from. So we've looked at it and said that on average that that alpha is, is $71,000. So for me, that means that that makes um, 
a, you know, it's a pretty easy decision. Do you pay 13 to get 71? For and me, that's a bit of a no-brainer. And if I've just joined you, that's a pretty easy thing to hold my hat on, which is a data and fact-based statement. Absolutely. So you mentioned results yeah. driven. What what else? Why else do people join you? Because we don't make people feel dumb. That's the other part of it. So we're like approachable. Didn't see that on the website, but uh, that's coming. Website three point zero. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but look, we're, we're pretty casual. Like I call it the playful professional approach that, you know, our team, and it's probably largely driven by my comfort in, uh, you know, drawstring pants and, you know, having a beard and wearing t-shirts and I'm not uh, a suit and tie type advisor. No one in our team wears suits as well that we, you know, we, we are who we are and we know that we're, we're people, uh, you know, people can be who they are, but then they still do amazing work. Uh, behind the scenes and provide people with you know awesome results outcomes you can do that in a t-shirt so our clients get that and they're comfortable with that and I, I think that for our team that you know we've particularly with advisors that we've had them to, to have joined from the you know bigger institutions and uh, you know not having to wear a suit every day is is pretty compelling but also having authentic, frank relationships with our clients. And I know a lot of advisors do that as well, but um, yeah, re really just because we are so heavily involved in people's lives and lifestyle planning to drive the financial decisions that they make, that you end up like being a, a really crucial part of someone's life and helping them shape the decisions that they make. So I think to, to go back to your question, it's that the work has a real impact, that it does actually work. We're incredibly transparent in what we do. We're one of the few businesses um, around the place that are entirely fee only. So, yeah, so if you guys don't deliver, like if you don't deliver, they're not coming back for the next 12 months. So, that's so right. it puts massive competitive pressure on everyone playing I, I grade. Absolutely. And we haven't built the reputation that we have in the market by not delivering for our clients as well. And we know that people do need to take a leap of faith before they come in, but we can show them all of those results. We're confident we deliver. We have to show them after we deliver the plan, what is the upside that they get? So, uh, you know, if you want to do real great work that has a great impact with great people, we've got a no dickhead policy with our clients. So I feel like that's a really compelling thing that if we know that if someone is not the right fit, either from a financial perspective, but importantly, from a mindset perspective or a what they want perspective. For us, we would it, we know that it's easier to let them go and find another business that is the right fit for them than us trying to fit a square peg in a, a round. A pro dickhead business, a, is that what A pro dickhead business? <laughs> Do they have those? I'm not sure. Uh, um, but anyway, it's, you know, good work with good people that respect and value the work that we deliver for them because we know that that's the only way we can create the you know good long-term relationships what that means is that people's days get to be enjoyable plus also just while we're talking about um selling points that because of that structure of how the business works is that we've got specialists in all of the areas you know for an advisor they don't have to muck around with sales meetings and prospecting and having you know five hours a week or a day a week taken up with chasing up people and trying to get deals done. We're not, we've got people for that. Because you've got a business development manager or a sales role specifically for that, yeah? That's right. And yep. we've got and I think you mentioned earlier for that and yeah. implementation people and we've yep. got associates to do that. You know, and basically we only want the advisor to do what the advisor needs to do. Then we've got the associates and they love trying to do stuff that the advisor can do because they're developing, but it means that the advisor Part of their progression gets, to do, plan, yeah? gets to do less. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm a big one on, you know, people working in their genius zone and then having other people develop into the stuff that they enjoy doing less. So um, on that, your team, uh, I'm here today in your wonderful podcast studio in George Street in Sydney, but um, uh, you're a hybrid team, I work from anywhere, you've got a global team. Maybe you give us a feel of, of where you are now and, and how, what things that you and your team put in place to maintain sort of uh, the cadence of operational cadences as far as meetings, but mm. also how, how you have fun together given that you are potentially not all in the same office. Yeah, well, we've got the two office locations. So we've got one office in Cebu through VA Platinum that the guys work out of there and there's a number of 
of other businesses. It's a co-working space like this is a co-working space that we're in today. Our Sydney team or our Australian team is all based out of our Sydney office. Yep. Although we do have work from home, you know, we've got flexible working arrangements, but all of our team members are primarily based out of the Sydney office. And the reason that we do that is we're a growing business. We know that everyone's developing and learning and we learn better as much as we, you know, you can crank out work on Zoom. We learn better when we're when we're working together, yeah, and I think, uh, and you don't have the luxury when um, uh, when you are a growing business to make mistakes, yeah, and have big blind spots, and it's easier, yeah. And we've got a lovely office here, you know. There's sparkling water on tap, which we're enjoying here. We've got the golf sim upstairs, the ping pong table downstairs. It's we've got a lovely space there, so that people can work in a in a good space and also bring a good vibe into their meeting. Even though we're still doing ninety nine percent of our meetings are done virtually with clients. Uh, you know, I think having that good space is is important. Well, I'll play devil's advocate here because, you know, if we had a dollar for everyone who said, uh, you know, people stay with us because of the ping pong table, they do, they do stay with you for the first little bit because of that. But in reality, it needs to be about their also their career progression, both from, from an intellectual but also a financial perspective. Mm. At Pivot, have have you um, introduced things like a employee share scheme or, or, or any other kind of rewards? that enables your team members to, to flourish? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, talking about the engine room, that it was two years ago that we we started really ramping up the focus on team, basically, and we sort of skipped a couple of steps in terms of the evolution of the business, but we had a really small team. Then COVID happened, market melted down, then it started going ballistic. And at that time, our team basically tripled within the 12 month period, our team size. Wow. So we grew from six to about 18 um, really quickly. Not ideal um, uh, for a whole lot of different reasons. Sticky tape and staples um, on the HR. Yeah, you start, <laughs> you know, like you're barreling down the expressway with, uh, with things not sort of, you know, 100% built for that. Uh, we learned a lot of lessons in there. Then our team size actually came down. And um, from that point, we realized that we need to go all in on team, how we're working together, how we're developing the team, how we're rewarding the team, how we're measuring the team. And that's where a lot of the things that I've already touched on, a lot of them sort of began from and then evolved into. But essentially now um, what we do for is that basically every – well, the, the two main roles, and we're working through the business, but essentially for our advisors and associates, there's a clear salary banding and progression plan. So it's yep. basically like if you achieve these, if these three different stages for an associate, you know, your incomes are, it is going to be this, then it's going to be this, then it's going to be this. For an advisor, they've got income bands, which are based on the revenue that they generate, yep. as well as with a, with a gate opener around their net promoter score with their clients. So basically, so long as you're at a certain level of net promoter score and your revenue increases, that then we, um, we can tie that back in. That's all because we are uh, entirely sort of fee for service and not linked into products. That's all like... Um, what are those things around the compliance? There's a word for it. Well, conflicted REM, you know, safe and all of that sort of stuff. So that's all really clear. So, In addition. So sorry. quick one on, on the net promoter score, and I wanted to raise this here. So because hmm. sometimes people who are analytical just say, well, it's revenue less cost equals the bit that you keep. And if the more you keep, um, the more we'll pay you. But would it be fair to say that, that, that a, an improving or indeed declining net promoter trend is a, a pretty good indication of whether people are going to renew? Is oh, that, is for that, sure. Is, it's a so, leading so indicator. So you would have a waiting, I imagine. That's right. It is very much a leading indicator. So for those people out there building their engine room, um, I would 100% endorse what, what Ben and the, the Pivot team are doing because no point paying a bonus for someone who's done a scorched earth behind yeah. them. Well, that's it. And that's what for, for the net promoter score, we measure at the start of the, you know, once someone joins and once they get their plan throughout the middle period and then at the time that they renew or don't renew, I suppose. When, when it comes to the salary banding, we're really just looking at the front end NPS because we want to make sure that you can, like I could onboard 15 clients this week if I wanted to, but I would do a terrible job because there's no way that you can do all of the things that you would actually need to do to do a good job in that amount of time. So we want to make sure, yeah, you're doing the work, but it has to be of a level of quality that the clients are satisfied at the back end. Then we know that if you keep your clients happy, they're going to keep renewing and then your ongoing revenue is going to build. Therefore, your total revenue is going to build and therefore your salary is going to increase. So it's like an inbuilt mechanism for the advisors that, 
yeah, they could not have happy clients, but then they're not going to renew those clients and then their revenue won't grow. Then we're having a different conversation. Yeah, so it's a self-fulfilling anyway. prophecy. Anyway. And, but you, you can tell that. So, um, But yeah. we do that. We do then, we've got this, uh, a team incentive plan. So basically every person in the team can earn 50% of their salary, like their total REM package each year um, in bonuses or incentives or whatever label you want to put on that, which is split between our employee share options plan, which we set up. So on ESOP where we've carved out a, a bunch of equity into the business, granted to the team, vest over a period of time, as well as cash incentives, uh, based on their performance as well. Really clear lines of, you know, as an analytical process focus type person that there's clear metrics that, you know, if this, then this, it's not like how much do I think someone's worth or how much do they get? It's like literally you achieve these outcomes, you get these points, they contribute to this, it means this amount of dollars. And given the way your price is, um, uh, you can be very close to cash accounting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, we know what's what because we've got agreements for mm -hmm. stuff. So it gives us a clear line of sight to figure out what's appropriate. So we've discussed a bit about um, sort of the evolution of, of your practice and um, the way in which, you know, the, the key takeout is is that you've divided the, the sales role um, and then the execution role into pods and, mm -hmm. and the client experience. And what would be the percentage, incidentally, of the renewals roughly of, of clients from um, deciding to continue every year? We, well, it's currently sits around 50%, mm -hmm. although we've gone through a couple of evolutions of our service in the last two years, such that the current evolution in its format is only just over 12 months old. Okay. So, so data coming for, but maybe asking in 12 months time. Yeah. Cause we only switched to the 12 month fixed term contracts to on the 1st of June. Uh, the 1st of July, rather, basically two years ago. And then the first, our first version of these 12-month fixed-term contracts was not good. Um, we'll learn a lot of lessons there in terms of like really complicated, uh, structured, you know, not in the right way. Um, so then we had to sort of unwind that and then filter more people through. So, I, yeah. Don't well, that, that makes sense because, you know, quite often when people come to you, the catalyst for them coming to you is because they've got a bit of a mess. Mm. You know, they've got a bit of a mess. They, they kind of don't understand where they're at. So there actually is a fair bit of work. And if, ironically, um, when I had the, the announcer business, we would often laugh that, 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 that if you did your job really well in the, the second to fourth year, there's not as much to talk about because you nailed it. Maybe yeah. when they go and have kids or they change jobs, you know, they come back to you and, and they're, they're never leaving and you yes. re-engage re on that fees. But, but, yeah, the better you do your job and, the, and the, the better you've structured their plan, potentially there might be a little bit of time where – they're just making it win mm. and then as life moves on, right? Because you've got a lot of wealth accumulators in your client base. Yeah. And, well, um, I think about a quarter of our clients are probably where they've got some certain things that they need to get done in the first instance. Yep. And that first 12 months, it sets a lot of those things up. Again, with that Smart Money Accelerator, we can now tick people down into that lower touch, lower cost service and then wind them back up. Perfect. And we know, so it's that years, the year two renewal from year one to year two, is it going to have a higher level of drop off once we go though from year two to year three then our renewals are like 75 percent because we know that they're people where we can add consistent value yep. over time and yep. then it's a higher um number and they, they probably have more things going on with them as well exactly. so so I'm, I'm keen to also hear about um uh, you know you're across a lot of different financial planning businesses with your experience and mm. And being part of the, the the founding team at Ensemble, you've you've seen different different sorts of business models. What do you see as far as your vision for the future of the structures of financial planning firms? Well, I think it's sort of like what we we've spoken about already, where advice businesses are getting more and more premium, sort of similar to what we've seen in the accounting space, where you're working with people that have more ways that you can add value, you can charge more fees. And I think that's where the, you know, the higher touch advice businesses will go. I think there's a huge gap for us to fill as an industry and partly with technology as well for everybody else. We've already seen, you know, more and more solutions come around investment management. And I think that that will continue. Uh, I think education-based solutions or like what um, Vince and the team are doing over at Life Sherpa, like phenomenal business, really data-driven, you know, ultimately really cheap, cheap relative to an advisor subscription model, tons of value in it though, but through that more quality 
uh, data collection, which is still a very laborious and a resource intensive process for advice businesses. So I think that will develop more. And um, yeah, I, I think that we'll see better, you know, through either AI or AI with better content and, yep. and video people educating, ultimately helping people make better decisions with their money, which is what advisors are doing. It's just when the decisions are slightly less complicated and lend themselves a little bit more to doing that. I think that we'll see technology and more, you know, scalable solutions filling that space rather than a, than a human sitting across from someone. And so, um, seven years in at the moment, you've got just under 20, 20 in your team, um, spread, spread, spread between two countries, but, but the, the advice is here in Sydney, but in saying that your clients are from everywhere because they're, that they're mm -hmm. quite often digitally engaged. Mm -hmm. um, what's the future for Pivot? Um, are you a, a, a looking to to sort of now that you've 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 almost beta tested a lot of your different sorts of things? You know, you've, you mentioned then you've had some successes, you've unwound some things. Now that you've got this proof of concept, and you do have quite a lot of people who who, who follow the, uh, the the way in which you think and the way in which you position, mm. where do you see the growth of of the business? Are, uh, would you be interested in, in growing it into different states or, or what, what's your, your vision? Yeah, well, we our grand vision is to have 100 advisors in the team, 2028, looking after $100 million of revenue. So pretty uh, – that actually scares the shit out of me. We, um, we didn't speak about this before, so. but that's just, that's just <laughs> blown, blown up fairly well. So, okay, so you need to find 100, 100 advisors. And so 97. That, 97. 97 <laughs> advisors. Um <laughs> And no doubt you've got the ability at the front end to do that. So what, what, what there, where do you see then the role of the general manager, chief operating officer? Because clearly you can't be both and you're not both in your current business. So are we going to be seeing a new uh, Ben Nash or, or are you going to clone yourself or, or are you just going to be putting in better structures or more structures for your operations team? Well, I think that as the business grows and evolves that we're bringing in more people to drive different parts of the engine room of the business. So um, the last two years have been really like, particularly the last 12 months have been really consolidation periods for us as a business. We, going back three financial years ago, we were growing between 50 and 75%. Um, to from last financial year to to the one that just finished, we grew by um, uh, sorry the year before we grew by fifteen percent. Last year was closer back to fifty percent, but it's been slow. It feels slow after after growing at you know seventy five percent a year. So trying to sort of pump the brakes and and make sure that we had our structures yep. engine room right before we keep going down the path. I think took took a, a fair bit of patience. But as I see it, there, there's six engine rooms in the business. You know, you've got your um, leads, conversion, client delivery, operations, uh, the leadership, and your product uh, and innovation. So over time, the intention is to bring in people to head up those those engine rooms and then remove the dependency from me for doing it. I'm still currently responsible for four of the six. I've got Tim that's driving a couple actually just one of our superstars about to come back from mat leave so she's going to take over one potentially two and i think that that evolution will continue i think for for any advice business to be successful it needs to we need you want to have people you don't want to be dependent on any one person it doesn't matter who that that person is even in, yourself in the business yeah and um as much as i enjoy you know, creating content and educating people and, and being on social media. I think for me, success is that that's all happening without me having to do that. Not to say that I won't, but just without it needing to be what happens for the business to be sustaining. And um, I think it's fair, not, it's fair to say that. to get to that 100, that will have to be at some stage in the journey. Has to. But in the very short term, we spoke- so many TikToks I can do. <laughs> that's man. it, that's it. In the very short term, we spoke uh, just before this about, um, you know, I said, well, you know, right now, Where's where's your problem or your need? And you, and, and you basically said, look, we have an extraordinary number of, of inquiries, but we're deficient. One senior financial planner to, to, to do the executional work and, and one BDM or, or business development manager or sales person right now. So uh, are you literally looking for people as we speak? Yeah, so we're, we're recruiting for a sales manager and a senior advisor at the moment. They're the two big ones for us. We've got a ton and it's increasing. Uh, so is that the evolution of a new pod? 
Is that what you're thinking? Well, no, because at the we've got two sales managers at the moment, but one of them is a financial advisor, and he's actually a really great sales manager. But he really wants to be an advisor. I'd, I yeah, and he will be a great advisor. I wish that he'd be happy to just stay and be. The, you know, the he pro- he might listen to this, by the way. He probably will. He's actually <laughs> taking five weeks leave over in Europe at the moment, so uh, you know. So, so you're looking, you're looking to, you're looking to fulfil his progression plan and, and get into the well, technical we'll replace side. him, yeah. then release him as an advisor, okay. and then we bring in another senior advisor, and we've just added two, um, two advisors to to our capacity that uplifts our new client capacity by about 12, 12 new clients a month, which is a pretty significant uplift. And then from there, we backfill the rest of the pod. You know, once we've found that person, we want to find someone that works in well with them to deliver the work that that sits underneath, but has to start from the top. Um, and then and then go down from there. At that point, you know, we've got then we've got five advisors, five pods. Um, you could have yeah. times that by twenty, by twenty. Game 28. on, yeah. So apart from being a, a charismatic frontman in your business, um, uh, you're a fellow director of uh, Ensemble, and and I, I, the big the big positive of that is that you've you're in the trenches. You're, you're running. You're, you're working in a business. You understand all the positives. You understand all the challenges. And I'd like to thank you for taking. Uh, your time, not just for this one, but your continual guidance and, and, and continual feedback loops for for the ensemble business um, to make sure that we're continually always making sure that we're, 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 we're staying relevant to the problems day to day. Well, uh, Roxy, I'm happy to be the last man standing because it's funny when, when XY Advisor started back in the day, it was all advisors and slowly it's like if people are, oh, yeah, retire from advice and uh, you know, it's it seems to be the progression. So I don't know if I'm the crazy one or maybe you guys are, but anyway, well, I'm your line into the advice industry. So that's uh, it. Here we are. It's been a pleasure, Ben. Thank you very much for um, unpacking your engine room and I wish you uh, all the success in the future, mate. Have a Thank good one. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Chat soon. See you guys.